I'm Connor Rebush, and if you are interested in the finer points of face punching, you've come to the right place. This is Heavy Hands. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of Heavy Hands, the only podcast dedicated to the finer points of face punching. I am your host, Connor Rebush. With me is Patrick Wyman, and uh, we predicted it would be a good event. It turned out to be a good event. We we come to you now in the aftermath of UFC 192, which saw an all-time classic play out between light heavyweight champion Daniel Cormier and uh, now two-time light heavyweight title challenger, Alexander Gustafson, a whole lot of other interesting fights all over the card, and we're going to spend the rest of today's episode talking about those fights, but I think we got to talk about the title fight first, right, Pat? Oh, yeah, we absolutely need to talk about that title fight because that was lit. That was an excellent, excellent fight. <laughs> it was lit. <laughs> it was lit, man. He's, the guys combined to land 260 significant strikes. Well, That's I have heard that strikes, it was not man. only more strikes landed than in uh, any other fight in light heavyweight title history, but any other fight in light heavyweight history in general. Oh, yeah. Dude, that was, is what I've awesome. been told. It was a fantastic fight. Yes. What are your immediate takeaways about it? Alexander Gustafson came in. I mean, this is the second fight now that Gustafson has been in with the, the champion of the division, that he has lost a close decision, and it has just been electrifying fun from beginning to end, both men giving each other hell. Does it does it kind of suggest to you that Gustafson maybe doesn't have what it takes to break through against that elite level of of uh, ego and, and, and competitive spirit? Well, I think that, first and foremost, we have to remember that Gustafson still has room to get better. Gustafson is not yet a completely finished product. He's, He's 28. Close. He's 28. He's very young still. Yeah. He's. I'd say Gustafson still has a couple of more years to uh, to get back to or to get to to get to his like peak form as good as he can possibly be. Um, so and and I think that there were good things and bad things to take away from this performance when we're looking at Alexander Gustafson. Uh, if we're looking at Daniel Cormier, you and I both thought that this was a much tougher matchup for him than anybody gave 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 credit for. I think we were pretty vindicated in that. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, I think that we saw the best Daniel Cormier that we've seen. Yeah. And, the big thing that that occurs to me is how much more comfortable he has looked successively from the Jones fight to the uh, to the Rumble fight to the Gustafson fight with being the aggressor with with pressuring and pushing forward and being and just be, having to to stay in an aggressive frame of mind how much more comfortable he looks with that in each successive fight absolutely and i think it's it was it was definitely a growth process right because that at heavyweight, he was kind of the guy that Gustafson is to light heavyweights now. Not that he ever had Gustafson's build, but he had the speed advantage. Uh, he always looked really quick, light on his feet. He could he could afford to fight at range even against even bigger men at heavyweight. Uh, though, of course, none of them really had the reach of guys like John Jones or Alexander Gustafson. But he could afford that because of his speed, uh, his relatively small stature. Now at light heavyweight, he's fighting guys who are most of them in frame, if not in weight, as big as the heavyweights he was fighting, but also faster, and most of them more athletic. And so I think he's probably correctly identified that he needs to he needs to push the pace in his fights now against guys like Gustafson and Jones. I don't know that it's necessarily the only way to deal with a tall guy. I think Cormier probably um, could fight at range and not put himself in so much trouble if he wasn't rushing after his opponents. Uh, he'd probably have an easier time of rushing after his opponents if his his uh, defense was a little better. Did, did, I, did I never realize before this fight that Cormier has pretty holy striking defense? In, in the sense that it has many holes? Yes. Yeah, not, um, not as in blessed or yeah, <laughs> incredible. It's always, it, yeah. <laughs> worthy of yeah. reverence. Yeah, no, I mean, I think he's always had, he's always had those holes. But, but he held... Like to to come back to your point about the difference in Cormier between him fighting heavyweights and him fighting light heavyweights, like it's easy to get away with more defensive holes when you fight heavyweights. Yes, it just is because when the difference between fighting Frank Mir and Roy Nelson, uh, and and even to a certain extent Josh Barnett, uh, Josh Barnett with a broken hand at least, um, the difference between fighting those guys and and fighting the Alexander Gustafsons and John Joneses and Anthony Johnsons of the world uh, is substantial. Like. And that's part of the that's part of the thing too. 
he does he didn't have to be aggressive against those guys because he knew they were going to come after him. They were going to have to, right? And so it, it it wasn't required for him to to march his way to march his way forward. I think he's got fairly decent defense. I wouldn't say he's got subpar defense. He's not a he's not a defensive master. We got to remember he's only been striking professionally for five or six years at this point. Um, well, I should say I, I think what really stands out to me is that his defense does not lend itself to his offense at all. No, Corn, no, no. Uh-huh. He, he's not he's, a he's not a sitting duck, uh, but. Once he starts punching, he's there to be hit. Once he once he commits to a forward assault, he's there to be hit. And his primary mode of defense here against Gustafson, which is a particularly risky measure against such a lanky fighter, was to pull his head straight back. He tried to pull and create distance against a guy whose best obvious attribute in this fight was his ability to cover that distance with his arms and legs. Disagree to I, I disagree with that to an extent. I think that I think that you're right about that. But I think his primary mode of defense is not keeping his head on the center line when he throws. That I think that he, uh, and I think this is true of a lot of the AKA guys actually, are very focused on not getting hit with same time with same time counters, and that makes them paradoxically somewhat more hittable when they're actually done throwing. Like Do they hang the, out in the pocket. Yeah, because because I, I think look at Cain Velasquez's dipping jab, right? Like that is that is Velasquez's fundamental strike. Um, uh, Cormier throws a great dipping jab. Both of the but and Cormier when he throws a when he throws a right hand, especially when he throws his overhand, he gets his head way off the center line. He's very hard to tag with same time counters. Gustafson didn't really succeed when Gustafson was jabbing. He didn't succeed at, at disrupting Cormier's rhythm with the jab. Why? Because Cormier's head wasn't there to be disrupted. Um, sure. But but with that said, yeah, no. When after Cormier is done throwing, his head is right there. His head pops right back. He's not generally angling out, especially when he's trying to be aggressive, when he's trying to move forward. Yeah, he's there to be hit. He's for sure there to be hit. But so was Cain Velasquez. We saw that uh, We saw that when he fought Fabrizio Verdun very clearly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's almost like Cormier's head movement is, is – it's like he uses his defense to cover distance when he's trying to get in on a shot, mm-hmm. but not when he's boxing. There's a strange divide among these AKA guys, I think. Uh, you know, Kane is like this, Cormier is like this. There's kind of a strange divide where while, yes, they are great uh, fighters in all phases, I'm not sure that they necessarily – Sometimes, like with Cormier, sometimes he's kickboxing or he's wrestling. You know what I mean? He's – you know, I don't it's, – it, it's, it's kind of weird because he's often and, – and I'll say this about Gustafson too. This whole fight was like a weird mixed bag of – good phase shifting from both men and poor phase shifting from both men. When Cormier got stuck on the outside at range, uh, he didn't know how to counter punch with Gustafson at some times. It was like he wasn't able to anticipate a punch with his head movement and then come with a punch. He did it a lot when he would come over and go over Gustafson's hips, but once he couldn't get the takedowns, it's like the way he defends defends punches for boxing is completely different than the way he defends them to set up his wrestling. And and then for Gustafson... uh, I, I, I praised Gustafson for this. I still think it's, it's probably one of the strongest areas of his game. In, in the article I wrote about him last week, I talked about how his wrestling, uh, his offensive wrestling is key to his ability to be an outfighter because in MMA, the clinch is not a neutral zone the way it is in boxing. Not that clinch fighting isn't a thing in boxing, of course, but you can step in and tie a guy up and most refs will break the fight. And you can't do that in MMA. Right. If you want the ref to break the fight, you've got to be able to wrestle the guy and control him. Um, and you're better off probably just wrestling him enough to get him to back off. And that's what Gustafson does well. He He's a good enough offensive wrestler. His timing on his shots, the fact that he can threaten your balance and try to throw you on your back, that allows him to step in and close the gap when it's no longer a good idea to keep backing away. And he did that at times very well. Uh, as well as he did in the Jones fight, as well as he's ever done, if not better. When he hit a takedown on Cormier in the second round, he, man, it was beautiful. He stopped Cormier's takedown. Cormier was like, all right, I got to keep up the pressure. He walks in, no jab, no setups, no feints. He just walks after Gustafson, maybe trying to to, uh, ice grill him a little bit, trying to intimidate him. And um, Gustafson times him perfectly, right? As Cormier takes a step in with his left leg, Gustafson changes levels, comes in, and puts him on his back. Beautiful timing using backward movement to draw the guy into a takedown and knock him off his feet. Well, he's got it, the I mean there are two pieces of Gustafson's takedown game that really stand out to me. The the first is exactly what you said, how good his timing is, but then the second is what a clean finisher he is. Yeah. Like I really think he's one of the very best finishers of takedowns in in the entire sport. He uses like, great head pressure to tilt guys off balance. Really really turns the corner beautifully. Yeah. Uh uses his it uses his own leg, a tall guy to create a table and the combination of that and the head pressure to get the uh, to finish um like 
he's a really excellent finisher of takedowns. He's a really excellent wrestler, period. Yes. And that was the really underrated thing to me going into this fight is, is how good a wrestler Gustafson is. That like it's Cormier, obviously tremendous defensive, a tremendous wrestler, period, and a tremendous defensive wrestler. But Gustafson is that good a wrestler that he could take down Daniel Cormier twice. Yeah, like, and he's not just a six months of sprawled training kind of fighter. He's not a Mirko Crow cop, right? No, he's I've he's I've spent multiple training camps wrestling or like mat wrestling with Phil Davis at Alliance and working through a succession of the Swedish national team. Yes, like that's the kind of wrestler that, that Gustafsson is. And Absolutely, to the extent that he's probably a little overrated as a striker. Sure, yeah, but the the wrestling. thing, the reason I bring it up is because there, just as there was that weird inconsistency with Cormier, where sometimes he was phase shifting beautifully, uh, Gustafsson had this bizarre thing where it was like it was, it was either him stepping in and taking down Jones and just stepping through Jones's punches and fighting beautifully in the pocket or him desperately trying to get away when it was no longer an option against Anthony Johnson. He did both of those things repeatedly in this fight. Uh, you know, turning his back and running more than I've ever seen him do. And granted, he was against a guy who was pressuring him more effectively than most opponents do. But I don't know. Uh, it was something we saw in the Rumble fight because he was really shook when he first got hurt by Rumble, uh, and there was a lot of pressure on him. It's not something we've ever seen from him before, uh, not to the, that the extent. The back and running? Yeah, not to that oh, extent. He did that, against, he did that against John Jones, too. Yeah, and Jones does it, too. And I think at some, uh, to a certain extent, it's just kind of an instinct, a bad habit that a lot of tall fighters get uh, when they're, they were like, oh, shit, this guy's way too close to hit with my jab anymore. Quick, quick, get out of here. But it, it, it does... It, it, it really bothers me that Gustafson does it as much as he does yes. because he doesn't need it because he's got no. great foot speed to start with. It bothers me when Junior Dos Santos does it too. And I think yeah. like it's hard for me to watch Gustafson do that because he did it uh, – like I think you're underselling a little bit how much he did it against John Jones. He did it a lot against John Jones too. Okay. Um, and I think that that has a lot to do with why he got tired in the fifth round of those two fights. Yeah, it's very it's inefficient, inefficient, right? You, exactly. One, one quick pivot will do as much work and leave you in position to hit the guy. That's a, and that's exactly the thing that kills me is when you've spent as much time doing striking training as Alexander Gustafson has, you should know better by this point. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and, uh, you know, another guy who does it is Junior Dos Santos. And it drives me nuts when Junior Dos Santos does it too, because you don't need to do it. Mm -hmm. And like, it's, it's really hard. It, like, it's not just the, it's not just the energy it takes to literally turn your back and run for that split second of time at a time when your heart rate is already elevated. It's that there's a little you get an extra little spike of adrenaline there when you do that and that way yeah out. it's like a it's like a flight or fight kind of thing right i That's don't exactly think it can be good for is, your yeah. mentality either to literally feel yourself running away from the guy and thinking okay when i turn around is he going to be six inches behind me or is he going to be waiting at the cage and i can reset it's a yeah. very it's a nerve-wracking kind of thing to go through over and over as much as gustison did it and i think that's why i think it's more of a mental thing than it is a technique thing because if you see gustison in a fight where he's relaxed he hits pretty good pivots uh, he sidesteps well. His lateral movement is, is some of the best in the sport. Um, but when the pressure's on, as it was in this fight, it, he does it. And, 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 you know, maybe he did it a lot in the Jones fight, but it, I don't know. I, here's a question for you, Pat. Um, if, is Alexander Gustafson, since the Anthony Johnson fight, did he seem broken or, if not broken, damaged in some way as a result of that knockout? Um, it seems to me that it was a lot easier in this fight for Cormier to put him off his game than it was when Gustafson fought Jones. Yeah. Like the, the, what's, what really stands out to me, the really concrete example of this is the way that Gustafson stopped throwing his cross after a while mm -hmm. um, because he, he got countered in two ways. I missed this the first time, but, but Cormier got his takedown off of a cross. Um, you, you pointed that out to me, Connor. But then it, I think it was in the second round uh, Gustafson throws a throws a really nice cross. Uh, Cormier Cormier slips it. Uh, kind of it kind of grazes Cormier, and Cormier comes back with a big right hand that clips uh, that just clipped Gustafson right on the chin. And it's like after that, he only threw the cross, specifically the cross, like I don't know, maybe four or five times in the rest of the fight. He completely got away from it, mm -hmm. and like the ability to be disincentivized like that, like that that is, does not strike me as something that the Alexander Gustafson of uh, who fought Jimmy Manawa. I don't think that getting clipped with a, with a counter in that fight would have put him off quite the same way. It didn't put him off. He got clipped with a big counter in that fight, and he kept going. Yeah. Granted, Minowan not pressuring him as much. The stakes not as high. But it's hard not to imagine that that had something to do with... Because he got count he got countered big time when he fought Rumble. Too. Exactly, it was a big counter, and then and that's the thing. Like I, Gustafson, 
is one of the best guys in MMA with that wrestling game at stepping in, closing the distance. And then in that Rumble fight, it was one of the first times where I really notably saw him like not knowing what to do. He was caught on the end of another guy's range and didn't know how to react. And we saw similar reactions in this fight when uh, Cormier would grab him behind the head, get that collar tie, and just hold and hit. Uppercut, uppercut, uppercut. Gustafson was kind of lost when that happened, where he was just kind of floundering. And we saw, of course, um, Joe Rogan. Great observation. We rag on Joe Rogan a lot on the show, but he was observing throughout the fight that Gustafson kept looking at his corner, which stands out to me. A lot of fighters do this in grappling. It's a really bad habit that jiu-jitsu players pick up in jiu-jitsu training where it, you have more time, particularly when you train in the gi. There's a lot of friction. You can afford to hold a position and look. You don't get the hold positions in striking, not even in the clinch, really, right? The positions shift rapidly, so you have to learn to listen to your coach and not look at him to hear what he's saying. That's, and, that's why um, this is something we, we've talked about before, but, but it's particularly relevant here. Uh, like, Rafael Cordero makes a habit of, of speaking very loudly in training and really getting his guys to focus on the sound of his voice so they never need to look at him. Yeah. Never. And I think never. it's I, – another thing I've heard from – it's interesting from coaches is having, like – just having like key words uh, and things so that your your fighter knows to listen to you because it, it's very difficult uh, for fighters to pay close attention to voices that they're unused to and mm-hmm. more so to listen to detailed instructions in the midst of a fight. The, the corner is the time for the detailed instructions, but when you're trying to guide a guy from the corner uh, with live advice, you need – so like uh, my my mentor, Luis, he, like, he just says yes very loudly when things happen that he likes. Very encouraging, affirming, yes, not yeah, not yes, good, or something, just yes, yes, when something happens that he likes, that you're doing, just to encourage you to do that more. Um, and the instructions are simple, and the affirmation is simple. Um, but, you know, again, I don't really know what kind of instruction Gustafson was receiving. What I do know is that he kept turning his head away from Daniel Cormier, who was pressuring him all night long, which to me, is, and, and that's a thing that he has never done before. Yeah. I've never yeah. seen him do that. And it's very hard to be efficient with your movement and efficient with your use of space when you're turning your head and you're and you're running. Like exactly, it's you're not. I mean, the way that John Jones handled distance against Daniel Cormier, it was a masterclass because he never moved more than he needed to. Yeah, like that was that was what really stood out to me rewatching that fight to to scout Cormier for for this one was was how efficient Jones was with was with that and how much trouble that gave Cormier that Jones was never moving more than he had to, whereas Cormier was having to move all the time, all the time in that mm-hmm. fight. And even though it looked like he was moving a lot in this fight, he was moving a lot. He was moving in ways that generally he was in control of, mm-hmm. as opposed to the Jones fight where he was forced to chase in ways that he wasn't here. Did they have, they had the statistic come, at, come up at one point during the fight of how much distance they had covered. Mm-hmm. I'm going to try and find it. I'll bring it up like apropos of nothing later on in our discussion, but it was fascinating because Gustafson moved i don't know twice as much uh as cormier mm-hmm. covered twice as many feet uh or you know something like that I'll, I'll have to you know i have the video playing right now so we'll wait and hear the statistic but cormier did what a good pressure fighter is supposed to do he did a much better job of cutting off the ring than he has in the past he stayed consistent he used his long strikes um particularly his kicks early in the fight i really liked how he went after gustafson early with his kicks try to destabilize him make him feel that Gustafson couldn't own that long range the same way Gustafson did when he fought Jones. Uh, yeah, I thought it was a beautiful fight in many ways from both men. But uh, ultimately, I think it came down to the mental fortitude and Cormier came through in the final round um, in a big way. It, it was by far the best head body work we've ever seen from both fighters. From both like men, in, yes. Yeah, in terms, of, in terms of mixing in those shots, mixing the combinations together. Um, and, and, and also... This was something that stood out to me all night, but especially in this fight, was the use of, of strikes to catch at different levels and different and different angles of movement. And the way that both guys were very intelligent about the way they did that, um, especially the way that Gustafson used his uppercut to catch Cormier mm-hmm. to catch Cormier ducking to shut down his entries. Like this was something that Dominic Cruz talked about when I interviewed him last week and asked him uh, and asked him about this fight was how important Gustafson's uppercut was here and how good Gustafson is. At, at using that to catch uh, to catch Cormier ducking, that it wasn't it wasn't that Cormier wasn't shooting because he couldn't take Gustafson down. It was because Gustafson shut down all of Cormier's favorite entries off of everything. Mm-hmm. And I think that's part of the reason why Gustafson stopped throwing the cross too, is because he knew that Cormier was going to key on it, um, and and that he could catch him with the uppercut as he came in instead. He could show him the same 
hip movement, the same angle, the same opening, and catch him coming in. And he did a bunch of times. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, ultimately, he turned it into a a kickboxing match. Yeah. Which is why it's so interesting that Cormier was still able to compete with him as well as he did. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, and the reason for that, I think, was was the clinch. Like, yeah. have we, I mean, Cormier is just a monstrous freaking clinch fighter. Which like, makes it even more impressive um, what John Jones did to him. Does, have you ever seen anybody yank as hard on a single collar tie as Daniel Cormier? No. And yeah, it was like, well, maybe Johnny Hendricks. Maybe Johnny Hendricks, right? Yeah, which, you know, Johnny Hendricks uses his wrestling and MMA in many of the same ways that Cormier does. He doesn't go for the high crotch lifts and things, uh, which we pointed out before we began recording, did not used to be a thing that Cormier did. I think it's fascinating that he has keyed in on the high single and specifically the lift out of that high crotch position as his go-to takedown finish against guys who do not want to be taken down. Is it maybe because as a wrestler, he was countering other wrestlers' takedown attempts? And so we didn't get the chance to see it, and now he is forcing takedown attempts? Well, what I think, I, yeah, we, we were talking about this before the show, and I think what we see from a lot of really, really high-level wrestlers in MMA is uh, a diversity of takedown threats that, that we don't see in their actual, in their wrestling games as wrestling games. You know, like, like Yoel Romero was a specialist in the ankle pick in his in his wrestling game but in but in mma we've seen him hit doubles we've seen him hit we've seen him hit some singles we've seen him hit uh step outside throws lateral drops crazy outside trips yeah we've seen him hit lots of stuff that he doesn't normally see and i think that's because when you can wrestle at that level you have your whole you have a broad arsenal of takedowns that most wrestlers will, will only dream of and a lot of them include techniques that are very hard to stop unless you drill them all the time that you don't see and you just don't see in MMA. Like, how many high crotch lifts do you see in MMA? None. <laughs> yeah. Basically so none. It makes sense to key in on that as a technique that guys don't use. Yeah. You know? Like, it took John Jones bringing in Ed Ruth to, to work on specifically shutting down that kind of thing to, 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 get, that, uh, to get that stopped. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what it took for Gustafson was just shutting down the ways for Cormier to get there. But, mm-hmm. but the point being, like, I think we see these elite wrestlers key in on techniques that you just – that are really hard to train for. Did you have a moment of fear uh, since both of us predicted that Gustafson could stop Cormier's takedowns when yes. Gustafson was <laughs> ragdolled in the first round that your reputation would be ruined? <laughs> yes, I was, I was very afraid of that. But then, like, but over the course of the fight, I was shocked at how right Dominic Cruz was about the way that Gustafson went about shutting down the takedowns. It turns out that wasn't enough, but, like, he was, he was pretty prescient about what the game plan was going to look oh, like. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Really impressive fight from both men. As you said, I think both of us feel pretty vindicated at how competitive it was, but Daniel Cormier also shut both of our big mouths up by being much better than we expected him to be. All credit to him, all credit to both guys. I'm sure we'll be bringing it up several points throughout the rest of the show, but um, we'll have to wrap up this segment. When we come back from the break, we've got other fights to talk about. K1 Ryan Bader made an appearance in outstriking and outwrestling veteran Rashad Evans and Albert Tum- Kuminov made much quicker work of Alan Joban than either of us expected. So all of that after this break. Okay, wait, stop. Don't skip this break. I know you skip most of them. It's a podcast. It's not a radio show. You don't have to listen to the commercials. But if you follow my very simple instructions, you'll be doing a huge service to Heavy Hands, Pat, and myself. First, go to Stitcher.com or iTunes.com. You can use either of those services to subscribe to the show, which makes it really, really easy to listen to every episode and not have to go hunting for it on our confusing, badly designed website. Once you're there, give us a positive rating and a positive review. That means go to the little five-star thing and click on the star all the way to the right. That's a five-star rating. That's the best one you could possibly give us and like 20 or 30 words about how you enjoy the show. It may not seem like much, but it's a huge help to us, and we really appreciate it. It helps us bring heavy hands to an ever-increasing audience, which is just good for everybody. So thank you for listening. Please take the time to give us a positive rating and review. Uh, Next time that you're on at your computer, at your phone, whatever, iTunes.com, Stitcher.com, search for Heavy Hands, give a positive rating and a review. Thank you. And now, back to the show. And we are back. Pat, one of the performances that stood out to me most this weekend uh, was that of Ryan Bader. And Ryan Bader is not a guy who tends to stand out. Many times you and I have said in the past that Bader's been very easy to overlook and undervalue. 
uh, in this recent time in his MMA career because, you know, we've seen his ups and his downs. We've seen – and his downs have been sometimes very embarrassingly low, such as losing to Tito Ortiz. It's not something that any fighter wants to be remembered. And because he's been on the big stage for so long, uh, I'll have to get the numbers, but he's been – he's spent the better part of his career in the UFC now. He's been in the UFC since like 2008, 2009. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, he's been in the UFC for a long time. He's got a lot of fights under his belt. I mean, the way that I put this on beat down after the bell on on Saturday, and I stand by this assessment, is it's just amazing how fast a conversation about Ryan Bader turns into a conversation about anything else, <laughs> like anything else, whether whether it's his opponent, uh, whether it's some technical aspect or something that he does, could be anything. But like, it's really hard to sustain a conversation about Ryan Bader through no fault, no real fault of Ryan Bader's own. There's no. nothing wrong with him. Not at all. I mean, if you look at the the embedded series before the fight, his new striking coach, Chaz Turner, guy that we're gonna, whose product at least we'll be, we'll be talking about more, uh, was like, uh, oh yeah, Bader is a is a great guy, and he really wants to be the best, but he just does not talk, and he's just like nobody's interested in him. He was like, you know, he, he's not that trash talking guy. Sometimes to his own detriment, and it it's that, and it, it also goes beyond that, right? Like fighting style, Bader is meat and potatoes. And uh, nothing else. Not even any salt. <laughs> like, it's a very plain meal. But meat and potatoes will fill you up. And, and, yeah. and we really saw Ryan Bader striking do the job against Rashad Evans in a way that neither you nor I expected it to. Yeah, I mean, I think that we thought that Bader could be competitive on the feet. I don't think that we expected him to completely shut down Rashad Evans' game no. the way that he did. I expect him to win a close fight. He pretty much dominated Rashad. Yeah, that was not, it was not particularly competitive. Um, I think that's a really good way of putting it. Like, it's not like Rashad was out of the fight, but Rashad was never in any real danger of winning the fight either. No, he like, didn't even land the big shots. I mean, it, it was it got to the point where relatively quickly into the fight, he felt he needed big shots to win, and he succeeded in landing maybe one or two, maybe. Yeah, and and even even that was not easy for him. He looked. I mean, Rashad looked kind of physically outclassed um, by a, a bigger, stronger, longer, younger fighter. Um, he and and he looked kind of technically outclassed too in yeah. a lot of ways. He looked like he got outfought um, and outfought. Well, like, I, I I've sent some folks when I did my sure dog preview when I called Rashad an awkward striker. He is an awkward striker. Yeah, he someone said, "Oh, is. what? He's he's one of the smoothest boxers in the UFC." I'm like, I mean, he might he looks that way when he's on. You know, he's very athletic uh, and very fast. And he certainly moves in a relaxed manner. But it would be like calling Ben Henderson one of the smoothest strikers in the UFC. It may be his nickname, but it doesn't really describe his boxing ability. Yeah, he, he when Rashad is on, Rashad is flurrying. Um, and Rashad, but, but Rashad is a very rhythm-based fighter, and he's yeah. got a very particular set of triggers for his shots. Like, yes. this, is, this stood out to me very clearly watching Rashad's last performance against Chael Sonnen. Um, the way that he figured out Sonnen's rhythm and matched his own rhythm to it and then started throwing these great flurries, like three, four, five. I think he even threw six or seven shots in one flurry against Sonnen mm -hmm. in a way that we hadn't really seen from him before. But so, you know, Sonnen is not a difficult fighter to time at all. Mm -hmm. Like, that's, that's, not Chael, that's not Chael Sonnen. Um, and what we saw here was Ryan Bader figure out Rashad's rhythm and completely shut it down. Um, like, he, Rashad has these little motions as he kind of bounces in front of you and a lot of the time, that that leads to a counter. If he can get you to throw there, he'll he'll counter. He'll go to his a couple of, a couple of punches and then his signature takedowns. Um, but but Bader figured out that rhythm very clearly and just used the jab as soon as Rashad looked like he looked was at that spot in his rhythm to pop him and disrupt it. It's exactly he's, what uh, Little Nog did to him. He's cat like, right? You can you know when a cat is going to pounce on a toy or a mouse or something. They set yep. their feet, they wiggle their butt, and then they spring, right? Rashad doesn't do the exact same moves, but you can tell when Rashad is getting set to launch that big counter right hand or the left hook. And I, I have all, all kinds of things to say about Ryan Bader that I never expected myself to be saying, uh, especially after the loss of his boxing coach, uh, Jose Benavidez Sr., who I thought was doing a great job with the fighters at Power MMA for, for a couple years there, when C.B. Dalloway was turned into a really strong boxer, Ryan Bader around the time of that Glover Teixeira fight, and um, the what came after that? It was it was the, I mean, the Matty Yashenko fight looked good, the Teixeira fight, the Paroche, the Cavalcante fight, all of those were around the time that he was with Jose Benavidez. And then right around the time of the Ovin St. Preux fight, uh, Benavidez left. 
and he's now with Chaz Turner. And I, while I'm not sure I agree with Chaz Turner's decision to basically rebuild Ryan Bader's style because he's now a very different stand-up fighter than he was then, I have to give credit to Chaz Turner for rebuilding him pretty well. Because while he looked a little rough against OSP and against Phil Davis, the pieces really fell into place against Rashad Evans. And, yeah. you know, oh, go on. Oh, the thing that the thing that stood out. This is something you pointed out when we were talking earlier. But I'm I'm I've I've pulled a page from your book and I've got this I've got the fight going in the background as we're talking about it. Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned the way that Bader's jab kept Rashad's right hand, his his big, his biggest weapon, really his his only outstanding weapon on the feet. The way that the jab kept that at home, but Bader used his left kick the same way, especially yeah. early in the fight. Uh, he threw the left kick to the body. He threw it to the head. Um, he really made Rashad feel when they were moving at range, like he couldn't, uh, like he couldn't feel comfortable throwing that shot. Yeah, um, specifically and, by countering Rashad's jab with those two weapons. Yes, exactly, and yeah, and, and I mean, I think this was a, a pretty brilliant performance from Ryan Bader. This was the signature win he's never gotten. I mean, you you know, say what you will about Rashad being older and and whatever the knee injury did to him, um, but this is. But this was this was big for Bader. This was the this was the big move for him. Yeah, and you got to say like the OSP, the Phil Davis. Those are those are big name wins, but they didn't look convincing for Ryan Bader. No. Uh-huh. And Rashad Evans has the name value of those guys, while maybe not quite at the same level as them right now any longer. He has the same name value, and you know, even this Rashad, I think, would have had a much more competitive fight with the Bader who fought Ovin St. Preux who struggled mightily with the awkward striking of Ovin St. Preux. Imagine if Rashad had, or if Bader had used his jab that effectively to disrupt the timing of OSP. Uh, it, it would have been a wipeout. Absolutely. I mean, and, and it still was close to a wipeout. It was still four rounds to one. But but like, but that was, you know, an entirely different facet of Bader's game that he didn't use in this fight. He What he used there was his gorgeous phase shifting. Yes. But he was so good at using his strikes to cover his entries and getting in on a really long guy who fights awkwardly uh, who's way, way, way out of range for takedown attempts. Yeah. Um, but he was able to get in on Ovin St. Preux as easily as he was, or as easily as he did, um, with without getting stung with the counters. And that that's that's a serious accomplishment. Yeah, and, and, and so the things I didn't think I'd be saying about Ryan Bader that I now am happy to say, having watched his performance, um, I think we've been underwriting how damn athletic Ryan Bader is for a long time. Tremendous athlete. A very fast, very powerful. Not only did he look bigger than Rashad, he fought bigger than Rashad in basically every phase of the fight. I think we have been undervaluing his wrestling. We've all known he has a wrestling base, but I think Bader has now proven that he can out-wrestle two of the best, most powerful, most explosive, most experienced wrestlers in the light heavyweight division. I would not be surprised to see Ryan Bader take guys like Daniel Cormier and John Jones off their feet. I really wouldn't. No. Um, no, I mean the version of of Ryan Bader that fought John Jones back in you know 2011, right? This was so Bader I think was four years into his professional career, under mm-hmm. four years into his professional career at that point. That guy was lost against a phenom talent. Yeah. Um, and now you know part of the reason Bader's been written off is because he's not a phenom. He was we a very him to good be. prospect who took exactly as long to develop as you would think a guy like that takes to develop. Yeah, and to our point earlier, he has been fighting since 2007. He's been in the UFC since 2008. Yeah. So we've seen I mean, every single thing from him. We've seen him look really bad, and and that's made it far too easy to write off when he has actually looked quite good. Yeah, I mean, I I really like this version of Ryan Bader for a lot of reasons. I mean, I think this is Bader is the kind of fighter where you, you don't get excited about any individual thing that he does, but I think he's a really process-driven fighter in ways that, now that I'm rewatching this fight, appealed to me. Mm-hmm. Um, like, there's nothing exciting about about the things that he does. But then again, at the end of his career, there really wasn't a whole lot exciting about what GSP did on a moment to moment basis. No, it was about breaking down the man in front of you, the most the, the the most efficient way possible. Yeah, and and late career GSP is still is probably my very favorite fighter for exactly that reason. Yeah, and there's a lot of. Uh, there's a lot of that kind of relentless, intelligent process about the way that Ryan Bader fights now eight years into his professional career. Yeah, like I, and this is nothing nothing against Ryan Bader. Like I said, he just strikes you as a guy that you don't have to pay attention to. And I know that sounds insulting, and if he listened to this, he'd be insulted by that. He's just not like a – he's not an electrifying personality. And so it almost like it feels innately wrong to be like, oh, Ryan Bader fights really smart. 
But he does. He did yeah. against Rashad. He fought a great, intelligent fight. Uh, another thing I never thought I'd be saying about Ryan Bader, his rhythm on the feet is really good. It's yep. really good. The way he, he was... He moves really well. He's very light on his feet. Yeah. such a big kind of... I mean, for a guy who looks like his like his upper half is, is made of, of cement in the shape of muscle... Like, he moves really, really fluid. Yeah, he reminds me of Sonny Liston in a weird way. Sonny Liston's yeah. build was like that. Uh, you know, he was, a, he was a heavily built guy, but, you know, he surprised a lot of guys with how, how, you know, intimidating and large and muscular he was with the craft of his boxing ability, having that what was always described as a lamppost jab, uh, which Bader has now shown to have. And, and the, the timing on Bader's jab is so good because of his rhythm disruption. Not only was he throwing it when Rashad looked like he was going to throw, he was keeping Rashad uh, from safely anticipating it by mixing up the rhythm with which he threw it. So he would have these little short half steps uh, or he would bounce on his feet and then uh, half beat faint and then step in behind the jab or he would throw it with no telegraph whatsoever right out of nowhere. He'd mix that in with the lead right to keep Rashad guessing. And I think that was probably the biggest thing here because the one thing that stood out to me immediately in this fight is how hesitant Rashad was to let his right hand go. Yep. And I think Rashad felt incredibly nervous about not having his right hand by his face. Every time that you could see he was in position to throw a right hand, Bader would crack him hard, especially once his eye got busted up. Bader would crack him with the jab, and uh, and then Evans would immediately bring his right hand back to his chin and parry the next three jabs that came his way. And while those next three jabs didn't get in, he had to worry about them, so he could not afford to let that right hand leave its defensive position. And I think it's important not to understate what a substantial accomplishment it is to keep Rashad Evans' right hand at home. Yes. Because... He, Rashad is one of the, the very best uh, lead right throwers in MMA. And I recall an interview with Rashad Evans where he was talking about how to throw a lead right. And the thing is, you just throw it, right? That's the Bernard. Like, he, he had some discussion he had with Bernard Hopkins, right? A video of yeah. Bernard Hopkins talking to him about just letting it go. Yeah. And that's, and that's exactly the, and, and that's exactly what has made Rashad so good is in the past, he just hasn't hesitated to throw it. And the and crazy thing fight, is it was Ryan Bader doing that this time. <laughs> Yeah, but it, but it's brilliant. You know, you can't understate what an accomplishment that is for Bader to completely shut down one of the bases of Rashad Evans' game, one of the one of the the, the main courses that has served him so well for so many years. Like to completely shut that down is not an insignificant accomplishment. Yeah. Um, and you know, mix that with the tremendous, unbelievable physicality and explosiveness that Bader still has, even now as he's getting into his thirties, to shoot a naked uh, to shoot a naked double, drive Rashad all the way across the cage and finish and, and get him to the mat. Like, come on, man. Yeah. I mean, that's against a guy, a wrestler, the caliber of Rashad Evans, who trains with the guys that Rashad Evans trains with. Like, who he knew Bader was going to wrestle, too. It's not like he went into this fight thinking this was going to be a striking match. Yeah. Like, that's that's a substantial accomplishment. We got to give Ryan Bader credit. Yeah, I, I expect it. I, for some time now, I've had a weird fascination with Ryan Bader. I have, just as we both did when we picked him against Phil Davis, and as I did this weekend, I've had a little bit of glee, <laughs> like a little smart-ass joy being the one who picks him, because I'm like, everybody counts Ryan Bader out, and it's because he doesn't look good, but guess what? He still wins. <laughs> so I I've just... In... My, I talked myself out of picking him in this, in this fight. <laughs> yeah. I literally talked it's myself so out. It's so easy to do, but I, I expected to come away with a little smugness. <laughs> I did not expect to come away from this weekend a Ryan Bader fan. But can, you know what? Consider me a fan. Like yeah. I may not get super up for his fights, but I will enjoy them. I will enjoy yeah, them. Yeah, and I will them. look forward to them. I won't be, you know, it's not going to be like watching John Jones fight or something, but I will look forward to seeing Ryan Bader fight again. Mm -hmm. I'm with you. I'm G there. Good stuff. Okay, let's take one more break then. Uh, I know we're going to talk about Tumanoff and Joban, but we're about 37 minutes in here, and that way we can have one nice long final segment. If we have time at the end of the show, we will also cover... Uh, the the plethora of wonderful heavy bag questions that we have you are our listen have from you our listeners so that after this break okay so here's another way you can help us out go to your couch lift up the cushions and scrounge around in the creases for uh, change lint uh, like bent paper clips and like a thumbtack that you stab your thumb on and then you scream alone in your living room throw all the stuff out except the change. All right, now take that and deposit it into your bank account or your PayPal account. Head over to heavyhandspodcast.com and click on the donate button on the right side of your screen. Whatever money you just found, which you weren't using anyway, send it to us, all right? Because Pat and I will use it. That money helps us keep this show on the air and free of charge, which is great for you. 
It's great for us because that way we're making a little bit of money. The donations are a huge deal for us. So please go to heavyhandspodcast.com. Any spare change that you might have lying around, hit the donate button on the right side of the screen and send it our way to help us keep this show live. Thanks. And now back to Heavy Hands. And we are back. The final fighter that we really want to focus on for discussion on today's episode is Albert Tumanov, who has now sort of solidified himself as the next big thing at welterweight. Um, not to put that Ryan Bader-esque pressure on him, but Albert Tumanov came into a fight with Alan Joban last weekend on the prelims, a fight that I picked out to be uh, the fight of the night. When I do my Sherdog previews now, I, I have my, my can't-miss fight, and this was it. And while it was can't miss, it ended up not being can't miss in the way I expected it to be. Because I expected this to be a fight in which Joe Ban's toughness and grit and power and willingness to exchange kept him in the fight long enough to start giving Tumanov some problems. Because Tumanov's not a great defensive fighter necessarily. He's somewhat hittable. And and also because he stays around and throws combinations. And we've talked about that in the past. What actually happened is that Tumanov just blew Joe Ban out of the water. Uh, he completely destroyed him. How did he do it, Pat? Well, he came out ready to throw from the from the very start of the fight. And Tumanov has been a guy who's been criticized, like Alan Joban, for coming out a little bit slow, for coming out needing some time to find his rhythm. Uh, but Tumanov came out ready to crack. And mm-hmm. what stands out, what really stood out to me, uh, was the way that Tumanov played his punches and his kicks together. Um, but not in the way that we th- that we normally think of in MMA, where you know where you go uh, punch, punch, kick punch, punch, kick in, in kind of the Dutch style rhythm that we've, we've grown accustomed to is thinking of a good integration of your kicks and punches, hiding your, hiding your kicks behind your punch setups, the way that Jose Aldo goes left hook to the body, right low kick. Mm-hmm. Um, what Tumanov did was uh, what Tumanov did. And what we see not a, uh, like you and I were talking about this earlier, Connor, but to, uh, but what we see from a lot of boxers turned MMA fighters or turned kickboxers is really selective use of kicks. The, and what Tumanov did was he would use his high kicks to freeze Joban's head in place, to make him feel like he couldn't move his head off the center line, to make him feel like he couldn't move his body laterally. He shut down the lateral movement and the head movement and froze it in place in order to land his straight right and his left hook. Yeah. That, and Tumanov throws, I think, the most murderous left hook in that division. Just a brutal, unbelievably powerful shot. And it was eventually... Kind of a kind of a straight leftish type thing that put uh, that eventually put Joban down, but but he completely cut off uh, Joban's ability to move laterally and to move his head, so it, it was just stuck right there on the center line, and Tumanov knew exactly where it was going to be. Absolutely, absolutely, and and the thing is, I, I, I maybe just picked up on this, and you can tell me if you th- if you think you agree or not. Does Tumanov kind of use his kicks more like a combination striker than most Dutch kickboxers do? I mean, I know the style. The style is often to uh, of Dutch kickboxing is to throw kicks in combinations, but they almost always come at the end of the combination. Mm-hmm. It's almost always the punches set up the kick, and the kick is like the boxer's left hook. You close the door with your kick, and you yeah. and you create space after you kick the guy. You off balance him so he can't throw back at you. Um, Tumanov. He and Joanna and Jacek does this too. Actually, we saw this in her fight with Penny when she finally felt comfortable enough against a grappler to start using her kicks again. Where the kicks will actually flow in combination. Hands will come before and after the kicks. The kicks will come upstairs and be used in the same way you might use a hooking punch or an uppercut to sort of create an angle for follow-up strikes. And so it's not like Tumanov is. Um, Dutch fighters tend to put all their weight into their kicks. Lots of body into their kicks. And Tumanov uh, is more like Conor McGregor where he just kind of throws it up there so he can keep his body on balance and in position uh, close enough, stable enough to continue throwing with other weapons after it lands. Like a, like a lot of Russian fighters, he throws his kicks in, in much more of a karate style yeah. than, a, than a Thai style. Like, like Rashid Magomedov throws his kicks like this. Um, I'm trying to think. Of, I'm trying to think of some other examples. Uh, Ruslan Magomedov, who fought on this card, throws his kicks very, very karate style. Yeah. Very, very quick. Uh, a lot of, a lot of chambering. Very like, like fast motions. Um, not, trying to land with the shin. I think that that's something that sets apart like Russian style karate, like Russian karate stylists from worldwide karate stylists. So they're trying to land with the shin and not the foot. But, but there's a lot of emphasis on speed. Rashid um, Magomedov. That's yeah, another both, guy who does the same Rashid thing. Rashid and Ruslan yes. throw their kicks that way. Yeah. Did you did you say Rashid? You were talking about Ruslan, right? I, I, I mentioned both. 
Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, but but a lot of Russian fighters throw their kicks that way. But it's but when you throw your kicks like that, it's much easier to follow with punches than it is in, to throw them Dutch style or or Thai style and come back with something. Like it takes a really advanced Dutch style kickboxer to throw kicks and then come back down because you put so much weight into them. That like Rumble did that against Jimmy Manawa. Uh, but it was like the first time that we've ever seen Rumble throw the kick. Plant it, get his feet planted again and immediately follow with a punch. Aldo will do it, especially he'll go right low kick to, to jab mm-hmm. as soon as they're set. But we don't see it very often in MMA because, it and, take, it, frankly, it takes a level of skill that's hard to acquire. Well, and while Johnson did it, uh, and Johnson sometimes does it in other fights, Johnson needs you to back up because he's throwing all of his weight forward into that kick. And he needs mm-hmm. to. He can follow with a punch, but it's like a shift punch. He's, like he's committed his weight to it, and he's just following through with another attack. Uh, Tumanov will throw it while you're backed up against the fence. You know, uh, for example, another guy who used the the more Anthony Johnson high style approach on this card, Ryan Bader, mm-hmm. threw a lot of weight into those kicks. Got Rashad backing up, and then flung his hips at him. Um, Tumanov wasn't kicking that way, but it made it very effective. He could he could basically use it in the same as a longer range punch to build off his other weapons. Uh, you mentioned the left hook. The thing that stood out to me in this fight was his uppercuts. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think I ever realized how good Albert Tumanov's shot selection is yep. with his uppercuts uh, and how well he uses them to capitalize when fighters either cover up so he can throw a short strike up under their guard and between their arms or when they duck their heads. Uh, and so the uppercut with which he finished the fight, he, he hit he hits uh, Joban with a head kick that kind of knocks him back and puts Joban on the defensive. He storms after him, comes in with a left hook to get him to duck his head down to the left, uh, his left, meaning uh, Tumanov's right, and then he just brings up his right hand and cracks him on the chin and it drops him, slumps him down in a heap. And to be able to throw like beautiful uppercuts in combination with both hands too. Yes. Like because he threw some really gorgeous left-handed uppercuts, lead hand uppercuts. Like which again, a strike that we very, very, very rarely see in MMA. Yes. Very rarely see. And when we see it, it's like a weird um, eccentric leaping sort of Prince Nazim thing, like Johnny Hendricks. Sometimes it's more of like an affectation. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, Conor Conor, McGregor even. But but it's almost always in that case thrown not in, thrown as the first strike in a combination yeah and it, it's like a flash kind of thing it's not like a, a solid functional piece of the combination i'm thinking of like uh, for examples of it being used really functionally as a really sound strike to follow up the right hand uh lucas matisse versus ruslan provodnikov mm-hmm. uh johnny gonzalez fought uh, i can't remember the name of the man he fought but he fought him a couple weeks ago johnny gonzalez used his left uppercut beautifully so if the guy ducks your right hand uh, you bring it up after the same way you use a right uppercut after a left hook, right? The left hook, he he leans away from it, and you bring the right uppercut as he's dropping his head down. Matisse, Matisse did good work against Victor Postol with that with that punch this last weekend yeah. too. Yeah, he's it's a brilliant. It's one of his best punches because he mixes it off of his right hand, and everyone's worried about his right hand. And his left hook works the same way. Matisse's actually got a very powerful left hand, um, like Rocky Marciano was the same way. Everybody worried about his right hand, but I remember uh, in the article. Of, in which uh, Sports Illustrated, they interviewed Archie Moore when he was about to fight Marciano, and, and Archie Moore correctly identified, you know, everyone worries so much about the right, the left becomes even more dangerous, and I think Marciano's got a really tricky left hook, and he was right. Uh, and that left hand is such a brilliant weapon if you're a good combination puncher for putting yourself back in position and for capitalizing on the way the opponent reacts to what is traditionally thought of as the most threatening punch. Yeah, and that's that to me is what stands out about Tumanov in general is just how good he is and how fluid he is at throwing those combinations. The, yeah. the fact that he's he's only twenty three years old, he's going to get bigger, he's going to get more powerful, his shot selection is going to get better, he's going to get more fluid. Um, that that we're just now seeing how he puts everything together. Like welterweight is a division that's stocked with powerful punchers at the top. Um, and Albert Tumanov could very well take his place among those guys. Yes. Like that he's, he's got that kind of raw ability to, to, to stand in there with the, with the Johnny Hendrixes and Tyron Woodleys and maybe not the Robbie Lawlers. I just think his power is kind of otherworldly, <laughs> but Tumanov is, but Tumanov has so much craft at such a young age and he's also an insanely good wrestler. Like, really 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 good wrestler and good phase shifting too i really like the way he 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 kind of countered joe band's attempt because joe band's a dangerous clinch fighter and it really looked like tumanov had prepared for that he picked joe band's knee up the first knee he tried to throw in the first clinch of the fight and dumped him on his butt and then hit him with like three uppercuts and a head kick as he was trying to stand up yeah that's that's a really that's a really really good point and and i think that 
it speaks to the depth of, of Tumanov's counter game that it's not just that he counters punches, he also counters kicks really well. He's got a lot of tools for countering kicks. So if you throw a naked like left switch kick it at uh, at Tumanov's body, he can catch the kick and trip you and take you off your feet. He did that to uh, he did that to Nico Musoke. He did that against uh, God. He, he did, uh, did that against his debut against Oldemar Alcantara. Um, he can counter kicks with kicks. Uh, he can counter your kicks with punches. He did that to Alan Juban. The first time Juban went to the well with his his very, very slick and very powerful left kick, mm-hmm. Humanov stung him with a right hand and took that away. Um, that He's just a guy who's got a lot of craft and a lot of tools and a lot of power and a lot of room still to get better. Absolutely. Yeah, and I'm looking for it. And honestly, by the time he gets to the top, I think Robbie Lawler and the old guard may be done. Yep. I don't, 23 I don't years old is unbelievably young to be performing at the level he is. So hopefully he doesn't suffer too many horrible hiccups along the way, but I'm, I'm excited to watch him develop. Um, and so we've got a few minutes left in today's episode, maybe about f- about five minutes left. And so let's go to the heavy bag. Our question this week comes to us by way of Victor O, whose Twitter handle is at Victor with a K, O, O, H. Uh, He asks, why do some fighters operate better when they're having fun as opposed to others who need to be serious or mean to perform well? What do you think? Do you have any examples that you can think of, Pat, off the top of your head? Well, I think Adrian Broner, who fought who fought last weekend, is a guy who needs to feel like he's having fun out there. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that conversely, a guy I, I think Robbie Lawler needs to feel like he's having fun. Um, to to go at the at the entire opposite end of the spectrum in terms of you know your level of craft and how good you are at, at what you do, I think I think Robbie does need to feel com- does need to feel like he's having fun. Uh, conversely, guys who need to feel super serious, like, like Josh Thompson, will fall into a rhythm a lot of the time where he looks like he's having fun in his fights, and that is not the good Josh Thompson. Ian McCall is the same way. Yeah, same same deal with Ian McCall. Um, guys who feel, need to feel like they're being super serious out there, I think Matt Brown needs to feel mean. When he fights, mm-hmm. um, Cain Velasquez. Yeah, Velasquez. I think needs to feel mean. I think Fabrizio Verdum is a great example of a guy who needs to feel like he's having fun when he's out there. Yeah, though he was he fought kind of a mean fight against Velasquez and looked really on point. But mean is fun for for Fabrizio. <laughs> That's true. For, That's, Fabrizio Verdum is secretly a very cruel man. Yeah, as, he has become substantially more so over the over the years. A kind of an, his psychology has evolved since I started tra- since I started training there to the time that I left. And like, maybe, he is a much, much different uh, fighter mentally. Than interesting. He was. Interesting. And maybe John Jones is the same way. John Jones is another guy who seems to kind of get uh, off on to be, on the Yeah, things. right. Like he, he may seem mean, um, but he's not really serious. Like the meaner he is, the more fun he's having. You kind of yeah. get this like he's kind of a bully. Mm-hmm. Uh, and not in the way where like bullies who crack, because he doesn't crack, he comes back. But like when he's really on top and dominating a fight, you can tell he's having a good time hurting someone. Kind of scary. Whereas, yeah, like, whereas I think, like, take GSP. GSP was a guy who was ice cold and serious. Yes. When yes. he was doing it. Detached. Um, yeah, very, yeah, I think detached is exactly the right word for that. Um, I think Jose Aldo is a guy who, uh, is, is a guy who needs, who stays serious all the time. Like, I don't think you ever see Jose Aldo really crack a smile in a fight. Yeah, I think he's definitely mean. Rarely. He's got the emotion, but I don't think he likes, he does not think of it as fun. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good distinction to draw. Um, who are some other? I think Dominic Cruz is a guy who needs to fight mean. He needs to feel mean in his head. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, what's the reason for it? What do you think? Well, I think it's all about finding your center. It's about finding what what's comfortable for you, mm-hmm. right? Like we used the example of Josh Thompson. Josh Thompson is a guy who fights much better when he's serious than he is when he uh, than he is when he looks like he's having fun out there. Um, but but so like clearly like he is. But I don't know. I'm trying to think of how to of how to put this exactly, but I think it's about knowing your personality and knowing what makes you comfortable out there, and knowing how to find your knowing how to find your waterfall, so to speak. Find your waterfall. Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting. I, I I always think to kind of how misleading that. Do you remember when they had that survey that talked about you know fighters who smile in the way in sixty percent of them lose. Or whatever it was, you know, it was not quite the incredibly compelling statistics, but basically the numbers showed that fighters who don't smile tend to beat fighters who do by a slim margin. Um, and I always thought that that really just kind of depends on what fighter you are, because I, th- I think there are some fighters who really do well when they're smiling and goofing around, having fun. Uh, that's when the the best comes out of them because they're relaxed, right? 
other yep. fighters, when they're relaxed, they're not focused. And so they need to be mean to be focused. They need to be goal driven. Um, yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a really good distinction to draw is it's all about what gets you into your zone. And for some guys, that's going to be like an on a, a, a being totally on edge. And for other guys, that's going to be being totally relaxed. Like, I think I'm better when I'm on edge myself than I do when I'm feeling totally relaxed. When I'm relaxed, I'm not throwing. Yeah, yeah. I have to be relaxed. Yeah. I, I turn I mean, to a baby think, when I'm on itch. <laughs> yeah, I think that that tells us a lot about our... I think that tells us a lot about our, our different personalities and the different ways that we approach things, though, yeah. right? Like, like I, I want to be in your I want to be in your face. I feel like I'm better when I'm swarming and I'm aggressive and I'm, and I'm mean, frankly... Than when, than when I'm relaxed and kind of sitting back and, and trying to pick you off a shot or two at a time. Like, that's not, I'm not comfortable then. Okay, see, now I see that. But for me, coming forward, it has to be a rhythm. It has to be comfortable. Mm-hmm. It's got to be like a, it's got to be a, a relaxed aggression. Where well, but I, see, I can't find my rhythm when I'm, when I'm sitting back. Or, or when I, I can't find my rhythm when I'm, uh, I, when I feel very relaxed and I feel like I'm really in control. Yeah, see, I don't associate sitting back with being relaxed. I associate sitting back with being tense. Because I hate sitting back because I feel like I'm wide open, which I well, am because I, I, I suck. <laughs> this, this plays into our discussion of types, though, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and natural natural types and, and where you feel comfortable. And I, th- I don't think it's uh, a coincidence that, like, counterfighters and outfighters need to feel – really kind of need to feel like they're having fun. Yeah. I don't know. I, like, I don't know if that's maybe an oversimplification because I'm sure we could come up with counter examples if we wanted to. Sure. I, it's, I mean, it's just introspection. I think it's, 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 it's a useful thing to think about. If you happen to be a, a train, a, a training fighter or somebody who trains martial arts for a hobby, think about how you have to feel when you fight. Cause it's interesting to think about, and maybe you can learn some things about your style. Both Pat, both you and I, uh, identify ourselves as pressure fighters. That's when we feel most comfortable. But we obviously approach pressure fighting in a very different way. You feel like you have to be intense and focused to to come forward. I feel that if I become too intense and focused, you know, what I mean, like like the more than I think, the worse I am. I'm more Matt Brown than I am. Um, I don't know a Robbie Lawler. I'm not yeah. a I'm not a it's, cerebral fighter. Yeah. See, if I but like, I start thinking too much when I when I get too relaxed. Like oh. it's hard for me to get in my zone that way. You know, that that point where you're not thinking for me is when I'm ultra focused. I feel like I feel like I can sense everything that's happening as it's as it's going to happen. I feel like my reactions are on point is when I'm kind of tense. And like, if that makes sense at all. Fascinating. Thank you, Victor, for giving us the opportunity to look inside of ourselves and ask ourselves the questions that matter, (laughs) such as would we smile at a weigh in someday? Probably yes. Pat, probably no for you. <laughs> no, huh? I got to feel like I have to get myself into that space. Pat is in, just in your heart. You're just an asshole. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Or I'm such a... I need to feel like I can put, I, like, or maybe I'm the opposite of that. And yeah, I feel like I have I, to push myself into that space. Honestly, I think that's it. I think you're a nice guy and you have to put yourself in asshole mode to be able to do something as mean as separate another person from their senses. Yeah, it could be. Could yeah. be. You got to put yourself <laughs> in the mindset, right frame of mind. All right. Well, thank you, Victor, for your question. Hopefully that that's a satisfactory answer for you. Uh, we're about to wrap up the show. But before we do that, I will let Pat tell you what he has coming out this week. Not a whole lot, actually, because uh, I was I was on duty on Saturday and I wrote a I wrote a post fight piece, the the real winners and losers from UFC 192. That's up on bleacherreport.com uh, slash MMA right now. If you want to if you want to take a look at that um, or alternatively, I will have a uh, kind of a smaller thing on uh, on the five best prospects fighting in the month of October oh. uh, coming out on Bleacher Report. Thin, thin month for prospects, but there's a few good guys out there. We got uh, Magomed Bibulatov. uh probably the best flyweight prospect on the planet, uh, making his World Series of Fighting debut. Uh, the, great, uh, the great Michael Page is fighting in Bellator. I mm-hmm. count him. I would count him as a prospect. Um, is this your old was, uh, Bloody Elbow Scouting Report prospect definition where they can't be UFC fighters already? Yeah, basically. Okay, so it can't basically. be because I was going to say, we got Darren Till coming up. He's a pretty hot prospect. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, like, I'm, I'm going to do another series looking at that. But then, yeah, but that's, that's about it. Pretty, uh, pretty light week for me. What are you doing, Connor? Well, um, I have a big two-part article coming out probably Thursday and Friday this week on the Gustafson-Cormier fight. I'm going to do a Pivotal Moments article where I look at the 
basically the defining sequences from each of the five rounds of that fantastic battle. And uh, earlier this week, I had a controversial piece coming out on Adrian Broner. You should check that out. Talk about bullshit and boxing and, and basically using theatrics to convince the judges and the fans that you're doing more than you are. And uh, you may be offended by it, but I think it's a pretty good piece. And so I hope you enjoy it. Uh, and I think that's basically it. Um, we'll see what happens next week. We've got a little bit of a break, but... Uh, the season is just about to start cranking up in terms of good MMA fights and boxing too. We've got Golovkin, Lemieux coming up. We've got Canelo Ooh. versus Cotto. We've got all kinds of and uh, Postal versus Matisse was a blast. We've got all kinds of good matchups coming up. So it should be an, an excellent month, an excellent basically fall and winter, both for uh, combat sports in general and heavy hands. So we hope that you guys will come along with us on the ride. If you want to find this episode, you can do so at heavyhandspodcast.com. We are happy to be brought to you today by bloodyelbow.com, and that is where these episodes always go up first. Wednesday mornings, Heavy Hands, new episodes every week on bloodyelbow.com. If you want to ask us questions for the show next week, send them to us on social media. My name is at Boxing Bush. Pat's handle is at Patrick underscore Wyman. And if you want those questions to show up on the show, or at least to be entered into consideration, make sure to tag them with hashtag heavy bag questions so we can see them and, and, and judge how worthy they are of our royal attention. Uh, thank you guys for joining us this week. We hope you enjoyed the show. We all enjoyed last week's card, and we hope you did too. If you came here today for the finer points of face punching, you came to the right place. This has been Heavy Hands. Heavy Hands.